Take your Bibles and go to John chapter number 21. John chapter number 21. While you're finding that, uh, and even when you find that, if you'll just look at me, I'm going to read you a, a separate passage that's going to connect to that passage. And um, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a word of prayer. Has everybody found John chapter 21? All right, let me read you Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 18. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now, if you go to John chapter number 21... And uh, we're going to read uh, verses number 1 through verses number 3. And, uh, and I'll tell you that story in just a few minutes. Just keep your Bibles there. Before we read that passage, don't you everybody look at me. Have you all been to a youth conference before? Raise your hand. All right? Put your hands down. Anybody, this is your first ever youth conference, youth meeting. Never been to camp or youth conference. This is the first time ever. One? A, a few? Okay. Um, how many of y'all, you've made decisions, whether like Dr. Jorgensen preached last night about surrender or it's been preached uh, this week about giving up different things or, or being called to preach, being called to the mission field. You, you've made some sort of decision at a youth conference, at a camp, at a church service. Some time in your life you've made a spiritual decision where you changed your, God changed your life to make you closer to Him or more like Him. And that happened at, at one of those services. Yeah, me too. Okay. Um, you are who I want to preach to. Now, those of you that's never been, I want to preach to you too, because I want you to join the, the group, okay? I want you to make a decision, okay? Um, but uh, here's the deal. I've prayed, okay? And I've fasted and I've prepared for this sermon. Now, I want you to be prepared. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. Right now... As I pray for, for, for the preaching, as we always do, sometimes almost me- methodically, I want you to pray. And as I pray for God to fill me with His power and to use me, I want you to pray for God to speak to your heart. Because if you'll ask Him, I almost guarantee He'll do it. He'll do it. Okay? So I'm going I'm to pray. And as I pray, I don't want you to just listen to me pray. Because I'm not one of those, he who flung the moon and hung the stars and God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph kind of prayers. Okay? I just talk to God. But as I pray, I want you to pray. And I'm going to pray for me. I want you to pray for you. That God will speak to your heart. Okay? And if you if you would... Would you tell God, God, if you'll speak to me, I'll listen and I'll obey. We do that for me? How many of y'all do that for me right now? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I need your help. Lord, I remember when I first started preaching, I used to, it used to be anxiety and, and wanting to get up so fast. And now, Lord, it's, it's usually tears and nervousness and not wanting to mess something up. But I need you. I need your power. I need your Holy Spirit to be upon me as I preach this message. Lord, and I pray that every hand that went up, Lord, wasn't in vain. I pray every young person and every adult that's in this room is right now, God, pouring your throne with requests that you speak to their heart and do something this morning in their lives. Please, God, meet with us this morning as you have every day this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. In John chapter number 21, I want you to see Jesus comes to the disciples. Now, I read Matthew chapter 4 in verses 18 through 20. And Jesus comes to Peter and Andrew and He says two words to these men that changes their life. Now, those of you that raised your hand that you've been to youth conferences and camps, you probably heard 25 sermons in five days, right? 
or something like that. It's amazing how many sermons we can pack into one day, amen? But you heard a whole bunch of sermons, right? Jesus comes up to these two guys, says two words. Two words. Two words. And these guys who were fishermen their whole lives go, okay. And we've heard thousands of sermons that contain hundreds of millions of words. And we still go, hmm, I don't know. Jesus, two words, follow me. That was God's will for Peter and Andrew. That's how simple God's will was for Peter and Andrew. Follow me. I'm going to preach along the same lines as Dr. Jorgensen did last night. God's will for your life is so simple. Two words. Follow me. Come on. Follow me. Let's go. Two words is all he spoke. And they threw down everything they had been taught, everything that made them money, everything that was their life at that time. They set it aside to follow him. But something happens. John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. Whoa, Peter, come out. Hey, what happened to Matthew 4? Follow me. Okay. Let me tell you what happened. Jesus got caught and crucified. And as soon as it happened, Peter said, Oh, I got it covered. I'm going back to fishing. Now stay with me. I got to spend about 10 minutes laying a Bible foundation and then I'll get to preaching, okay? If you, if you, if you'll just stay with me, I, I got to give you some Bible, okay? We're going to go all the way through John 21. So I've given you all the stuff right there. John 21, verse 3. I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They said, hey, buddy, if you're going fishing, we're going with you. If you've got a plan, we'll just follow your plan. That's what we did with Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. I've got a plan. We follow Jesus' plan. Peter, you've got a plan. We'll follow your plan. And they went with, with Peter out fishing. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught how much? Nada. Zero. Zilch. Nothing. Guess why? Because if you are not following God's plan, I don't care how big your boat is, or how many nets you have, or what kind of marine equipment that you own, you will never catch what you are going after. Or once you do catch it, you will come to the realization that you don't really want what you were trying to catch. They said, we ain't got anything, or we don't have anything. Have we caught anything? I love this. Verse 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Verse 5. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? Now, I love it when God is a smart aleck. Jesus, no doubt, knows they have not caught any fish. He could see their boat. He knew they had no fish in the boat. So Jesus, wanting to rub in the fact that they could not catch fish without Jesus, said, Are they biting the day, boys? And they said, No, they're not. So Jesus said, Oh, well, you know what I like to do sometimes? is Sometimes I like to, instead of fishing on the left side of the boat, I like to fish on the right side of the boat. And they said, Hmm. Well, let's try that. Look at your Bible, verse number 6. And he said unto them, Cast the man on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. 
Verse number 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It's the Lord. I think that's Jesus. Jesus shows them, now get this, Jesus shows them that God has control over even the things that does not pertain to spirituality. God controls where the fish bite. Jesus tells them where the fish are and how to catch them, and they catch a bunch. Verse 7 and 8. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, watch this, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. They realize this is Jesus and Peter who had apparently dropped his standards. Which, by the way, is the first thing that happens when you leave the will of God. The, immediately when you say, well, I'm not going to do it that way, immediately the very first thing that changes when someone is going the wrong way is the way they dress. Amen, Brother Davis. Yes, sir. Preach that one right there. Amen. Peter was naked. Now, whether that means he wasn't wearing a shirt or whatever that means, which, by the way, guys, that's good Bible, that you all not run around without your shirt on. Amen. 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 Peter jumps in the water. That's what the Bible says. It's Jesus. What? I don't care what anyone says, when you leave God's will to do anything, you may go to church, you may even hint that you are still right, but when you are not in God's will, the very first thing to go is how you dress. Boys begin to dress like punks or girls, and girls begin to dress like harlots or boys. Always. Always. But I'm in God's will. But I go to church. You can go to church and not be in God's will. I e Judas. Verse 9. Well, verse 8. And the other disciples came in a little ship. They was like, we'll let Peter swim in. For they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes. Here they come with the fishes. Now remember, where are the fishes? Where? In the net, right? This is good. Don't miss it. Verse 9. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. And what was laying on what land there? Fish. Now, was that their fish? What was it? That's Jesus' fish. Jesus was making Long John Silver fish sandwiches on the shore for the disciples. And He said, hey boys, y'all want a sandwich? And it's like, well, we just caught the... How did he... He wasn't even on a boat. And he's got... What? Amen. Because when you're not in the will of God, you don't understand how everything goes with God. Well, wait a minute. I don't understand how I'm supposed to live and how I'm supposed to provide and how I'm supposed to make it. How's God going to take care of this? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? Won't you just let God make you some fish sandwiches? He already had the fish laying on the fire and was making the sandwiches right there. Verse number 10, Jesus said to them, bring them the fish which you have now caught. He said, hey, look, I'm frying these up, but I know how you boys eat, so y'all better bring your fish too. Verse number 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 153. That's a good fishing day, by the way. Uh, That's normally how it is when I go. Uh, Not really. Normally I'm I'm fishing for squirrel when I go. Uh, there were so many, yet the net was not broken. Verse number 12. Jesus said to them, come and dine. None of the disciples just asked him, who art thou? Knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. That's where I get the fish sandwich, by the way. Hey, listen, if you read your Bible, it's fun. The Bible's not boring. It's fun. That's a fish sandwich right there. Bread and fish. Fish sandwich. Verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was risen from the dead. Verse 15, so when they had dined, this is after they eat, 
Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Jesus specifically asked Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? Now, I've preached that many ways. Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than your buddies? Do you love me more? But you know what? As I studied this, I think maybe Jesus was asking Peter if he got it. If maybe he understood that, do you get that you got to love me and my will and my plan more than your plan that you've made? Hey, Peter, do you love me and what I had for you when I said, follow me more than what you had when you said, I go a fishing? And you caught how many fish? Zero. Don't you like my way better, Peter? Don't you love me more than that? As I studied through the Gospels as I was writing this sermon, it seemed like Peter had a backup plan the whole time. It seemed like Peter... As soon as Jesus leaves in John 21, Peter says, go fishing. He doesn't sit down with a bunch of college, you know, a a, a bunch of uh, uh, options and say, okay, I could be an engineer. I could be this. I could be this. I could be this. I could be this. Okay, I'm going to pray about all this and see what God wants me to do. No, here's what he did. He said, I'm going fishing. He already knew. It's almost like Peter the whole time thought, you know, if this disciple thing don't work out. There's always fishing. You know, I, I mean, I'm a pretty good preacher, but but I've always wanted to be a fisherman. It's almost like Peter said, you know, I enjoy three days of youth conference with Jesus, but I really want to be a fisherman. Y'all with me? I ain't lost you, have I? You know, it's almost like he, he thought in his mind that if I love Jesus and everything, but man, there's good money in fish these days. And Jesus ain't even got money to buy fish. He's got to take two and break them and feed them and all that stuff and make captain disciples. And y'all that was here last year, get that. Those of you that wasn't, buy the DVDs from last year. That was a good skit. I'm not saying being a fisherman's bad. Unless God's led you in His will to do something else, then being a fisherman is bad. I'm not saying being a police officer is bad. Unless God in His will has called you to do something else at a youth conference last year or this year or five years ago or two years ago or three years ago and you can try to explain it away as an emotional decision, but if God has called you to do anything else than for you to do anything other than what God has called you to do, that, my friend, is bad. I'm not against you being a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist unless God has called you to be something else. And if you surrendered this year or last year or the year before or when you was five or six or ten, it's bad for you to be a doctor. It's wrong for you to be a lawyer. It's wrong for you to be an engineer. Because Jesus said, follow me. You with me? Peter said, you know, if things get shaky, I've always got the boat. I know where I left it. Remember when it says straightway they left all and followed him? Peter remembered where he left the boat. Peter must have kept his backup plan in his back pocket the whole time. When Jesus would scold the disciples or preach a hard message, maybe Peter would pull out his fisherman's license papers. And say, you know, 
I don't know how much longer this straight living and doing right and wearing the right clothes and cutting my hair and doing right and listening to the right music and going to church three times a week and going soul winning and working a bus. I don't know how long I can take it. Fishing's looking better every day. Don't look at me so pious. We do the same things. When he could, he would talk about it. When Jesus would be soul winning, maybe down on the seashore, I can see Peter saying, Oh, I'll go. I'll go. Oh, Jesus, I'll go. Let me go. Let me go. Why? So he get close to the water and to the boat. And he'd say, Hey, I remember this. Yeah. Wow. Man, I tell you what, if this thing with Jesus don't work out, I know where I'm going to be. Right there. And even though you go to Christian school, you think the same thing. When I get 18, I know what I'm going to do. When I get out of my mama's house, I know exactly where I'm going. Now listen, you may be a good kid, and I believe we've got a lot of good teenagers in here. Let me tell you something. That thought crosses even the best teenager's mind. Peter was a great preacher, but he still quit. Because he had a backup plan in his back pocket. Peter jumped right into his backup plan as soon as Jesus left the scene. As soon as he got upset or bothered or troubled, or as soon as, as soon as things got tough, as soon as he got around the world, as soon as he got hurt or things got difficult or he got a little shook up, as soon as things got hard, as soon as he hit a bump in a row, boom, right to the backup plan he went. Don't you understand something? God has a will for your life. And His will is a plan that is tailored just for you. When He saved you, He did not just save you from hell later on. He saved you from sin to serve Him now. Follow me. Not, I'll catch up with you later in heaven. Have a nice life while you're here. Follow me, He said. What is His will for your life? Some of you know because you surrendered. Now, some of you have went so far from your surrender and into your backup plan, you don't even remember five years ago at camp or three years ago at youth conference or two years ago at your own home church when you walked the aisle and you surrendered on that platform at camp or at this platform at youth conference or at another youth conference or at your home church when you gave your life and said, God, I'll do whatever you want. And God said, I want you to do this. And somewhere in some church, there's a card with your name on it when you surrender to do something. But you had a backup plan. And you don't even rem- You may not even rem- you You remember, but you don't want to remember. His will may be for you to preach. His will may be for you to be a missionary or to be a youth pastor or to teach in a Christian school. His will may be for you to, 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 to do something else, to, to work or, or do one of those other jobs that I talked about. But let me tell you something. God's will for your life is to follow Him now. I know what His will is for your life right now. Two words. Follow Him. Now listen, life ain't a play or a movie or a video game. There's no cuts or starting over. One shot's all you got to get what God has got for you to get. One shot. But I got a serious question for you. What's your backup plan? Honestly. All you that raise your decision or raise your hand that you made a decision, I ask you a serious question. What's your backup plan? What's your exit strategy? To get out of whatever you... Well, that was an emotional decision. Well, I didn't know what I was doing. Well, I was pressured. What's your backup plan? What do you got on the back burner that you're going to say, well, I'm going to do that because it's not that bad. What is, what is your plan if this whole serving God thing doesn't come out? 
What are you waiting to get out of a Christian school or out of your Christian home to do? What is, what is, what is your idea if, if Christian service isn't for you? What is, the, what, what is your plan if the whole Bible college experience just doesn't fit your personality? What's your exit strategy for standards and convictions? Well, that's Old Testament. Breathing's Old Testament too. You going to write that one off? <laughs> what if this independent fundamental Baptist thing cramps your style? Where are you going? Charismatic? Hmm? Hmm? You going to the community church? What if you decide you just don't want to do this anymore? What's your backup plan? I was in fifth grade. I was student of the month. Multiple months. And when you're student of the month, you get a poster. Now, not as good looking as that poster, but similar. And it had my picture on there. And underneath the picture, it had what we wanted to be when we grow up, what our favorite food was, what our favorite TV show was, and all that, all the way down. And on what I wanted to be when I grow up, you know what I put as a fifth grader? The president. That's what I wanted to be. You know what my teacher told me in fifth grade when I said I wanted to be the president? She said, you might want to have a backup plan. Maybe she knew my personality and knew that there was no way I would make it in politics. I tell the truth. Well, let me ask you something. What's your escape route? What's your plan B? How are you planning on getting out of God's will without looking like a complete failure? Well, hey, Mom, I mean, I'm not serving God, but at least I'm taking care of my family. Now, listen, this is big boy preaching, like Dr. Jorgensen was talking about. No booger stories or basketball stories. This is big boy and big girl preaching. But we need it, amen? Well, at least I'm taking care of my family. At least I have a house and a car. What about the will of God? What about doing the will of God? Is it a boy or a girl that's waiting on you back home or out in the world just in case? Is there a job or a career that you keep dreaming about? I mean, you surrendered, like Dr. Jorgensen was talking about. You surrendered. There's this one thing that you're just like dreaming of and thinking of. And you're like, man, I really want to do that. And if this thing that I surrender to, man, I hope nobody remembers that because, man, I don't really want to do that. I want to do this. God remembers. He wrote it down. He remembers. Are there things you're not allowed to do that you've been thinking about doing? Can't wait to get out and do them. Is there a secular school you got your eye on for when things don't go your way? Peter did. He had his, he had his whole mind made up. It might have been why he fell in the water that day. He was walking on the water and all of a sudden he started thinking, man, that would be a nice place for a boat. Whoa, whoa. Is that why it was so hard for Peter to pray with Jesus? Maybe he was planning his life after Jesus. She said, hey, I'm about to die. i got to go pray. And Peter said, about to die? Oh, my goodness. I better write out a budget for how I'm going to buy a boat. Maybe that's why it was so easy to deny three times so quickly. He knew that was a sure way to get to his plan B. When things got tough, Peter had an option, a plan B, a way out. But in John chapter 21, Jesus comes to the disciples while Peter's out water skiing and enjoying his plan B. I mean, Peter's all up in his plan B. He's naked. The Bible says. Peter's, Jesus shows Peter how messed up his plan B really is. And Peter comes back to Christ and surrenders all. Look at verse 18. I want to show you this verse. And this is a very interesting verse. But this is the verse I want to preach from. i got one point. It's a long introduction. One point sermon and I'm finished. Verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself. 
and walkest whither thou wouldest. Listen to this. Jesus tells Peter, when you were younger, you did what you wanted and you had a choice. You had options, Peter. You had options. You had a plan B, Peter. Watch verse. What's the second part of the verse? But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. He he's talking about how Peter's going to die, and he says, Peter. You surrender. You resurrender this time, and I want you to know, you're in for the long haul. If you surrender this time, Peter, I want you to get rid of your plan B. He said, "Hey, Peter, if you come back this time, no plan B, just one. Follow me. Just one. Follow me." In fact, he even repeats the will of God for Peter's life in verse 19. Watch this. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, what? He said, hey, Peter, my will ain't changed for you, Peter. Hey, Peter, the will's still the same, Peter. Follow me, Peter. Just come on this way, Peter, and I can use you. Just get rid of that plan B, Peter. I know where I found you just now and what you were doing and what you were involved in and those that you pulled down. I know what you were doing. But hey, Peter, if you get rid of that plan B, I can help you. I can use you. Follow me. Y'all see that in your Bibles? Peter goes on in Acts to preach Pentecost and burn it up for Jesus. I don't know what God's will is for your life, but I know these two words are God's will. Follow Him. God wants to use you. Whether it be as a preacher, or a teacher, as a missionary, as a soul winner, as a bus worker, as a bus captain, as a layman in a church, as a bus driver, as a youth pastor, as an evangelist. In some form or fashion, Jesus wants you following Him and serving Him. Some of you, God has called, and you have surrendered, but you've got a plan B. Some of you may have never surrendered your life to the Lord to do the will of God. But God has a will for your life. But you'll never fulfill God's will with a plan B on your heart. Did you get that statement? You'll never fulfill... God's will with a plan B on your heart. I got a story and then I'll give you the one point of my sermon. In 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortez headed to Veracruz to capture the island and retrieve the Aztec treasure. It was his few hundred Spaniards against the thousands of Aztecs. Along the long trip from Spain to current Mexico, many of the conquistadors tired and discouraged and longed to retreat. When they closed in on the island, it was seen, that, and it was seen that they were so outnumbered, the people grew even more restless. Cortez searched for a way to motivate the troops. He led them from their boats out to the shore and began to give a pep talk. Behind him, as he spoke, the people turned to see their boats aflame. Their only way home was now gone. Cortez led the soldiers into Veracruz and took the otherwise unconquerable Aztec treasure. Get this. It is believed that a written order from Cortez commanded one of his own men to set fire to their own boats. 
You want to know what the note said? Burn the boats. Because if they had no way home, there was no way they would retreat. Point number one, only point of the sermon. Burn the boats. Whatever boat it may be, whether it's a boy, that worldly boy, that worldly girl that you know is not God's will for your life, that boat that's pulled, that you know it could pull you from God's will, burn the boat. Whether it's a career that you got your eye on that you know God has not called or led you to do, but it's your selfish pride and ambition that's leading you to do, burn the boat. Whether it's a sin that holds you back and keeps God's power from being placed upon you and from God being able to truly use you in His service, burn the boat. Whether it's laziness that keeps you from winning souls, going soul winning, working a bus route, helping others who are not as fortunate as we are, burn the boats. Brother Davis, how can I resurrender my life and keep this surrender as I were, as I wasn't able to keep my previous surrender? I'll tell you how. Burn the boat. No turning back. No turning back. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I think some of us need to forget what you or others want you to be. And re surrender to God's will this morning by setting fire and burning the boats. Burn the boats. Lord, thank You so much for the opportunity to preach. Thank You for this youth conference. Thank You for these young people that came. Lord, I pray. I pray if there's a preacher boy in here who surrendered last year or five years ago. That God, those, those plan B's, those boats that are pulling Him away from Your will, I pray He would set fire to them. So that there is no turning back. There's no plan B. It's only follow You. If there's a young lady here, God, that surrendered to Your will, whatever it may be, I pray, God, that she would burn the boat. I pray if there's a teenager here, God, that's struggling with sin. I pray if there's a teenager here that's never surrendered to Your will, that today, God, they would burn the boats that may pull them from You, and may they surrender their life to Your will. Bless, I pray, the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name.